Welcome to the Understanding Project Management Discussions podcast. This is Dave Barrett. My guest today is Jonathan McKee. Jonathan's background includes management consulting, as well as project and program management, both in industry and as an educator. Jonathan has a focus on the business analysis process and has been the president of the International Institute of Business Analysts Waterloo Chapter. Our topic today is the gathering of project requirements and its transition to the scope of the project. We also discuss the role of the business analyst within projects. Please welcome Jonathan McKee. Hi, John. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Dave. I do appreciate it. Great. So our, our topic today is about uh, basically about scope, like all things uh, scope related and, you know, really answering the question of, well, what is the project going to do? You know, that, that's really, if you get to, to scope, that's, that's really what the topic, you know, that's, that's really what this, this area is talking about. And in preparation for this, I, I, I took a look online and they, you know, there's the old sort of famous, famous uh, Standish reports that are, that are produced periodically. And, and the latest one, it talked about the, the indicators or factors leading to failed projects. And I found it interesting that number one was incomplete requirements. And number mm. two was lack of user involvement, uh, which is okay. scope related. It, it really yeah. is all areas, but but heavily in scope. So it really is a an important topic. So so with that, my my question for you is, um, how do you like when, when you're managing a project? Like, what's what's your view of of scope planning? How do you approach it and and sort of get started on it? Uh, um, it it is one of those. I would say interesting areas um, in project management. And I think both out there in industry and especially in the classroom, I do find there is, uh, it's a difficult topic um, and concept to generally communicate. Um, a lot of people can understand business requirements, um, you know, customer, client, um, requirements. That sort of makes sense, but it's this whole translation uh, from basically those business requirements into project requirements and then turning those project requirements into project scope. And I think that's a lot of the time where you start to lose people, um, yeah. say as the project manager um, or say the professor instructor. Yeah. Um, it's they, it's what is this scope animal and how does it work? What is it all about? And eventually how do you get it into that schedule, I guess, down the road? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I agree with you. I, that, that's interesting because I've had the same sort of thing is that requirements are intuitive, right? Because we, we all want things, right? Like I, I'd, I'd really like a, a Tesla, for instance, that, that would be a, a want that I have. It doesn't mean I have the budget for it and so on, but, but requirements are sort of self-evident in a way. Um, but I agree that sort of translation into, you know, project requirements, like the, the ones that sort of make it through into project requirements and then that become the scope of the project, it's, it's not necessarily a well understood, you know, sort of a mysterious process. process. Yeah. Yes, yes. And you already mentioned something earlier, the project goal, and there's a tie in there as well. Um, and um, it's, it's how do you carry, uh, especially as an organization, an initiative through a business case and then into the project and uh, from basically, you know, that project charter and then into project planning or project right. initiation. I know different organizations will look at their processes maybe in their life cycle a little differently but yeah tell me like before we so let's let's go through that so but before we get to the the tougher part let's talk about the easy part for a while the, the requirements so what what have you done in terms of like what what methods how do you find gathering getting requirements as works or what has worked for you or or what have you done in the past on on requirements gathering right so from that perspective, this brings up the whole 
sort of concept right now that's quite popular, business analysis. And yep. the idea of a, a business analyst on your team, right up front in initiation, planning, um, really dropping uh, or delegating that requirements gathering or elicitation to that role, um, an individual. Um, so first and foremost, if I have somebody that's very comfortable and in that role or in, and I have that role available to me, I will definitely leverage it vis-a-vis uh, sort of gathering those project requirements. Um, but um, it does involve eliciting from the customer and client, uh, whether you're going through a project sponsor, bringing in the end user, um, uh, all sorts of, I guess, what, whatever level of involvement you want. Um, uh, and I guess there's many ways of going about that I've done from everything, you know, generally interviews, walking, observing, observing, um, sitting down, having a calm, just like we're doing right here. Tell me about, you know, like, tell me about that Tesla. Do you really want the Tesla or is it, is it really, or would you rather have some of that functionality like that big screen uh, right. that's in the, in the center of the car and that uh, instant one-to-one -one ratio between uh, acceleration and the drivetrain sort of thing. Yeah, um, that's, that's what and, I want. Yeah. yeah, that's where, and um yeah, everybody wants a Tesla, but that image in your head and the client's head, our customer's head is not necessarily clear, either in that business analyst or that project manager, project team. So yeah. how do you get that clearly understood by both parties in this case? Um, and in a way they both understand and agree to. Yeah, I, and, I, like, uh, I like that you've, um, you mentioned a business analyst. I. I I, um, my, my text has a business analyst in it. So yes, I, noticed I like that. that you, yeah. I like that you, that you uh, identify that and it can be other names too. There, there's oh, different, sure. yeah. there are different job titles, but that function of, you know, the person or people on the, on the team that they're, one of their, their responsibilities is to determine what the customer wants. Now, what do you see for the business analysts that you've worked on, the, the, you know, say the best business analysts, what, what were their key characteristics? What does it take to be a, a top-notch business analyst? Um, one thing really is attention to detail. Uh, another one is conceptualization. I know some of these are not a little hard to put your finger on attribute-wise, um, attention to detail, conceptualization, problem solving, mm -hmm. and um, also very, very good communication and documentation skills. Um, sort of goes along good with regard to, say, elicitation, um, following good best practices, I would say. Yeah. Um, that goes a long way. Those may be four or five things yeah. um, really set that foundation. Yeah, and, and I like to, you know, and I, I, I agree with all of those for sure. Um, you know, there, there, there is that detail orientation, um, that communication. I think you, you, you've got to be able to draw things out, like, and, and, you know, sometimes bring forth. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes requirements gathering is you, you get the avalanche of them, or sometimes you have to pull them out. <laughs> they're they're yeah. sort of. They're, you get silence or you just get too much. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They're, you gotta, you gotta get them out of the vault. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things though, when you were even, we were sort of doing that little role play with the, uh, with the Tesla is one of the things that I found really good business analysts can, can do is, is to, to almost look beyond what is being asked for to sort of the root requirement. You know, when I say I want a Tesla, yeah. but I'm, what I'm perhaps saying is those, you know, those things, I want a modern interface, I, I would like, maybe I would like a, you know, alternative energy, maybe I would like that smooth Excel. So are those the things you're after? Right. Uh, Dave, or are you, are you after the brand? You know? Or are you after the brand? And that could, yeah, that could very brand, well be. We're, yeah. we're good. You know, it yeah. doesn't be talking me out of what I want. But no, like no. That might be talking price. you into something you <laughs> can't yeah. afford. At half the price. <laughs> yeah, half the price. Um, but it does go back to the goal. And does, and that I would say the first thing, say, as a business analyst, um, does the customer and client and do you uh, understand what that project goal is? Uh, the requirements should marry back up to that goal. Um, it, it, it's not, that goal is not always self-evident. To me, the requirements help shape and define that goal very specific to that 
unique product service solution that right. you're providing. So um, I think there's a little bit of both going on there, yeah. um, but generally the two sort of flow, flow sort of together there. Uh, yeah. And hopefully you have a good starting point. Um, sometimes you do. Um, I've worked on projects where here's exactly what I want, the specifications uh, in, in you know, uh, infinite detail. Um, other times as a solution, wide open, uh, sort of big green space, uh, the sky's the limit sort of thing. Um, obviously there's not much of an elicitation challenge necessarily with that, you know, everything sort of packaged for you nicely with a bow, but um, obviously maybe the fun stuff is on the clear sky. Um, but that really does then involve working with uh, that sponsor, the customer client, right. your representatives, really to help shape what's in scope and what's well out, out, of, scope. out of scope. And what, what, does done, what, what does project success look like? What does a successful achievement of that goal look like at yeah. the end? Because I, I do say to my business analysts, especially in the ITBA program, um, you know, ultimately, I would love it that you would be able to follow all the way from the business requirement, all the way through the entire project life cycle to the very end, and that delivery of that solution, including the overall project, but you should have that traceability there. So even with all the changes that go on in the various phases or process groups, whatever, whatever your life cycle is, and your development and execution is, you should be able to put your finger on it. Uh, at any given time. Um, so, um, and, and to me, that's something I would, especially if I had that uh, full-time, say, BA or analyst of whatever the, the role might be titled, um, I would love to have them sort of involved throughout the entire project just for that reason. So there's continuity too. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, and in my, in my experience, the PM and BA should should be be as business analysts should be like this there there is a strong and there should be on a, on a well-functioning project there should be a really strong connection between the project manager and the, the the business analyst they should almost be in you know that that old saying they should almost be finishing each, each other each other's sentences you yeah. know and uh you know because they you know the, the pm has overall management accountability and so on for the for the entire project but but uh, you know that that BA is the is uh, you know kind of the I don't know what the right word for it is, but but they they really have the time and focus to really look at this question of what is the project going to do and does it uh, it does it match the requirements? Like are what we is is what we're doing? Uh, what's on that piece of paper? What's yeah. on that piece of paper? There, or in that in that customer and client's mind? Right. Is that There's really the what you want? Right. And um, yeah, they're the I, of, oh, sorry, sorry, they're, they're the guardians of that information. So, yeah, that, yes. I, I agree completely. Yeah. Sometimes I don't think they always appreciate that role, but I do definitely appreciate them in that role. Um, that that just generally goes without saying uh, when I was, say, a more junior project manager working on on projects, I always found myself falling into the PM role, but also doing the BA role. Um, and then eventually at some point, then I'm, you know, going and talking to then the systems analyst or that architect, say on a technology project or an information systems project. Um, so ideally if I could have both analysts there blending two worlds, that would be amazing. Um, but it's, it's something I think early on, um, uh, was either done or done un informally, uh, the role, the BA role. Um, sometimes you had somebody fulfilling it other times. Uh, I found a lot of the time as a PM, I would fill that role. Yes. Um, and, uh, you'd be that point of contact with that sponsor or the customer. Yes. Client. And then in those situations, I agree the, the, uh, th those are the BA and, and project management are both, um, they're both, they're both, the uh, uh, um, uh, job description or, or uh, you know, people or roles, but, but also Function, their yeah. responsibilities and functions that you're doing that the same, the same person in some projects can do both. So, you know, yeah, that's that double hat, you know, put, take one on off, put another one on and exactly. take it off again. When, when I said that you're like this, you're like this with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am, I, am I, am I thinking about the schedule today or am I thinking about the requirements? Yeah. Today? So yeah. sometimes so, that's a good thing. Sometimes not, but yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Let's, let's move on then to the what you sort of were, were leading with, which was the, the transition. Okay, we've got this uh, set of requirements. We, we've documented it. Let's say there is a business analyst involved and he or she is involved in that. And so now how describe that that process of conversion now and mm -hmm. what is that you know that that happens don't we just implement all the requirements like isn't that just okay we're done yeah um and that's where things start to fall down especially like we were talking at the start in the understanding um how do we take what is this like i said what is this scope animal and what are we doing when we bridge this from requirements into project scope um and this is some practitioners may not um, agree with me fully, but I sort of look at the scope as sort of the what and the how at a very high level. Um, so what are you building and how do you plan to do it? And this is also where I, I find I start to talk in terms of different project layers, like we have a project life cycle, but then, hey, depending on what we're building, um, what that solution is, then we might have a variety of different methodologies that we might wanna, how are we gonna build a server? I'm just gonna use an IT project here for a minute. How do we build a, um, a server versus develop the code uh, that goes along with it um, for that system, let's say, or for a bridge? Um, you know, each component on a bridge, maybe the road, the suspension, uh, the foundations, the pylons, they might have their own way of, of going about and they all have to connect at some point. Right. Um, I always find, um, and I do this um, when I talk about sort of project goals, project requirements, project scope, um, is, okay, come up to the whiteboard and, okay, draw me a bridge. And I can have a student come up. Um, and I, I'll just use the classroom example as opposed to, say, the real world here or industry. But pretty much anybody or, you know, could draw that bridge and, you know, uh, identify the different components that they see in building that bridge. Uh, then I ask them, you know, how, how do you, how would you go about this? And they can probably, if they've identified the components or like A, B, C, or one, two, three, list the order that would go into them and probably, okay, what are sort of, you know, then you can get into the other side of things, materials, specifications, and things like that. But if you just cut it off there, um, you know, the student can visualize the what and sort of a little idea around the how. Right. Now I ask them to come up and build an ERP system and unless they do it for a living, it stops. Right. And that's where I find out there in industry, uh, especially if you're by building something very innovative or never done before or something where, you know, a lot of moving parts, especially in IT, um, unless you do it and you have your approach down, um, it's very hard to understand and see and document that what, let alone the how as well. Without the how, yeah. No, yeah. That, that raises a, a really, and I, and I agree with you. You said, originally you said maybe some would disagree. I agree with you that it, you cannot talk about the what completely in isolation. Without, yes. Somehow just separate it completely out of the real world, so to speak. And, and talk about it in isolation. And in fact, um, interesting um, or, or story from, from my, uh, you know, past industry life was, um, I remember, I recall uh, working with um, a, a, you know, an, an analyst on a project and, and I was in the position of providing the requirements in that case. So I was on the other side. I was the, you know, the sponsor or the, you know, the, the subject matter expert in it. And, and I recall that, that the, uh, business analyst was saying, well, what do, what would you like? And it was like, well, um, I'm not <laughs> sure. What are the possibilities? You know, like, yeah. how much is this? And in effect, what I was asking is, how much is it going to cost me? Because my right. requirements will vary, you know, yes. <laughs> depending on, for example, going back to our Tesla thing, if we, if you, if I say, you know, I'd really like a Tesla, and then you say, um, <clears throat> Dave, it'll be a uh, uh, hundred thousand dollars, and I'll I go buy it down the, the street for you. Know, yeah, <laughs> I always viewed it as as somewhat of a, a give and take. It's a bit of a negotiation because if you know they they you know the old expression the, the, if the world is my oyster, you know I I, I got to mm -hmm. want it. 
But once you start bringing real world constraints into it, and like you were yep. saying, drawing the picture, or you start to bring budget into it, and so that's where uh, you know you don't want to you don't want to remind people at every turn as as you're and we're sort of back on requirements a little bit, but you don't want to constantly say to people, well, that's expensive, you know, because that becomes um, counterproductive. To counterproductive, what you're trying to, and it, right. it limits ideas. But at some point, and this be, this becomes the communication, how nuanced and how 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 you know the, the effectiveness of the communication, the, the, the BA's communication or, or PM if they're involved mm -hmm. in this, is really be able to kind of create the picture, like you said, you know, is it be able to can we draw this and well, what would be the what how big are we, are we how big are we getting here, you know, and and that's it's the facilitation of the space yeah. that you're, you're working with. Right. With yeah, and um, so you gotta, yeah, you got to bring eventually somehow bring those things in, um, but you don't want also to limit like you just said. Right. That's that's sort of somewhat yeah. of the magic part of it is that it's not like we we're looking for it to be a completely linear process. Mm -hmm. it, it, it it's not. Of, it's iterative to it, to a it, large degree. Iteration. There's yeah. bringing a little bit of cost, technology, doability. You know, do we have resources? Like all you you kind of mix all that together. And the scope kind of can can fall out a little bit now. Now another another sort of question is any any discussion of scope. Uh, we, we can't have had a discussion uh, discussion of scope without <laughs> the acronym WBS coming. Yes. <laughs> out. What's okay? So so give what's what is your view of WBS? Um, have you have you have you created them? What works? What doesn't? Like you know what's what's your view on those? Um. Just one thing I always do like stressing when it comes to WBSs uh, from a tool and technique perspective. I know there's lots you could draw it out on a whiteboard. You could use sticky notes. Um, one of my preferred tools is mind mapping uh, because basically what you're doing here is creating an outline and um, of basically the deliverables or the work uh, down to the work package level. Um, and I just find just as an FYI, I do find things like XMind or Mind Manager, any real half decent mind mapping tool uh, really can shine. Also, whether you're in a, you know, um, a workshop or even in from a remote perspective, because you can share the screen, easily move things around. That's, that's what I've, I've found is that, is that the, the WBS work breakdown structure process, it really forces you to, cons to, to really think about, well, what of the, the, the requirements that we've, we've gathered, what are we going to produce? What is in the scope of this project? Um, and the, the level of detail that we need to, to indicate, both in the work breakdown structure, but also the, the details of the components, of, of the deliverables right. that are in the work right. breakdown structure. And, and you, you mentioned um, something that is, is, I think everyone has struggled with when they've done when when they've been been managing a project is how much detail do you go like how far do mm -hmm. we plan before how deep we do say, you go okay yeah. we, we we we've got it let's go and start so yeah. what i don't know there isn't <laughs> a magic answer to this but what what is what is the process that you go or what is what do you think about when you're when you're saying okay we've got this documented we know kind of what the, the components or the deliverables are. We've got a work mm -hmm. breakdown structure that we've created. And it, you know, like you said, it can be, it can be functional or it can be according to the life cycle. There's like, there's, I often say that WBS is more of an art than, than a science. You're, you're sort of creating the structure of the project, but then, you know, how, how, how far do we go in writing down the characteristics of everything before we say, hmm, let's start to create it. And, and like, so is it, is it, you know, a, um, is, are, are the, the specifications of those deliverables, is it a 20 page document or a two page document? Like what, where, where mm -hmm. do you land on, on that type of thing between the, it's sort of the planning executing interface. Yeah, that brings up my my favorite phrase in project management. It really just depends. It, um, <laughs> it depends on the project, the practitioners, the team, the client, the customer, the stakeholders, uh, the organization, its its assets and environment and everything. So I, I think there's a there's a huge element of it just depends. But um, I do believe there are some good rules of thumb around a WBS, um, and the big one I think. It really is designed 
to really first and I think foremost, um, I will say the team is the team are what you plan out. It's the team that's going to build or do, and they need to be successful. As long as you've got those requirements, right. Right. They need, they need that level of um, clarity that the, they need that clarification, whatever level that is, that makes the most sense to them. Too high, you know, they might not know what's, what's implied. It just, it's got to have that, um, it doesn't have to spell out every little detail because, you know, um, if the people know what they're doing and that's why you're bringing them onto your project team, um, obviously a lot of the ins and outs uh, that might be unfamiliar to you should be routine for them. Right. So it's whatever, and especially going back to that, those facilitated WBS uh, workshops, like in the, the video I described there, you're bringing in those subject matter experts, uh, whether, you know, the people who will actually be doing the work or, you know, leading the people or responsible for the people doing the work. So they understand that work. They understand those processes, the activities and tasks that are eventually going to have to go under those work packages. Um, you actually brought up um, it's something I've been thinking about for several years now. Um, and you talked about um, how, what do you take? How do you take, like, I think maybe this is where you're going, those requirements. Uh, they may be written, it may be a picture, uh, but let's say they're written, uh, however they're written. Um, and then how do we get that, how do we get them into that chart? Right. Um, and how many times do we go around? I think it goes around until it's clear to everybody, and just to go back to the last thought, until everybody's comfortable with, they see, they understand it, and they can agree to it. And that also includes, if you got your team on board, then do you have your customer on board? I would say, if you have that, go back to your customer. Does this make sense to you too? Um, then I think you've closed the loop there. Anyone who is watching, and it seems fairly straightforward when you read about it, it's just, okay, you do A, you do B, you do C, you're done. You can, I think the, the real world of this process is, is very, it, it's, there, there's a lot to it. There's more than meets the eye. And, and so I think uh, you've, you've highlighted some of those. So I thank you very much for- Oh, not talking, a problem. Talking about it and- uh, We'll, uh, we'll talk to you again soon for sure. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Dave. Thanks. Take care.